But today we're going to return to the question of whether or not there's a God. Um, we've talked about empiricist arguments concerning experience, whether our experience of the world would in any way support the conclusion that there is a God or that there isn't a God. And today we're going to be talking about a priori arguments, arguments that start independently of experience. So we're not going to begin talking about the existence of the world or the existence of causal series that may or may not go back to infinity. We're not going to be talking about miracles. We won't be talking about other things like that. Instead, we're going to be talking about things related to the very concept of God, the whole idea of God. In short, we're going to be starting from things that are internal to the mind and seeing if we can work our way out from those to conclusions about the existence of God. Mostly, we're going to talk today about one particular argument, an argument that may or may not convince anyone, but nevertheless is really philosophically intriguing, raises a lot of intriguing issues. It's called the ontological argument. Now, ontology is just the study of what there is, and so it's a fundamental part of metaphysics. The ontological argument is uh, an argument about the being of God based on the concept of God. Augustine defined God as basically the most excellent being there is. God is something than which nothing more excellent or sublime exists. Anselm, Bishop of Canterbury in the 11th century, turns that around slightly. He says, God is that the greater than which cannot be conceived. In other words, not just the most excellent being there is, but the most excellent being there could be. The greatest conceivable being, the greatest possible being. And so, Think of God as the thing that you couldn't think anything better than that. God is that... Gosh. <laughs> well, Descartes will later simplify this into think God is defined as the perfect being. And that would be one way to think about this. For Anselm, he's thinking about being able to think of things that are better or worse. For example, what grade did you get in your, on your last paper? You could think, well, can I think of a better grade? <laughs> Probably you can. Okay? Uh, how about me as a professor? I'm pretty darn good if I say so myself. But can you think of a better professor? Almost certainly yes. <laughs> okay? Uh, think about the dinner you had last night. Okay? Maybe it was good, maybe not. You could probably think of a better one. And so on and so forth. Well, imagine a being which is so great that you couldn't possibly think of anything better. You couldn't think of any way in which it could be better. Okay? It is just the greatest conceivable being. That's God. Now, here is the way Anselm's argument proceeds. He says, even the fool, and here he's representing as the fool, someone who says, look, I know what you're talking about. I understand the concept of God, but I don't believe that God exists. Why is he calling that person a fool? Well, because of various references in the Psalms. For example, in Psalm 14, Psalm 51, the fool is somebody who says there is no God, <clears throat> but claims apparently to understand what we're talking about when we talk about God says, yeah, I have a concept, but I don't think there's anything like that reality. And Anselm is saying, in the end, that's an incoherent position. Even the fool is forced to agree that something the greater than which cannot be conceived or thought exists in the intellect, since he understands this when he hears it. And whatever is understood is in the intellect. So here's our first basic premise of the argument. That the greater than which cannot be thought, that being exists in the intellect. And all we mean by that is that we can understand the concept. The concept is of a possible being. Um, it makes sense, right? There's a concept here. I understand the concept. In other words, I understand what you mean by God. Yeah, I understand this idea of the greatest conceivable being. So that exists in the intellect as a concept. Well, saying that it exists in the intellect is already a weird way of talking, you might think. But don't be frightened. And so really just means I understand the concept. The concept makes sense. Okay? So I have the idea of God. But now here comes the exciting move. He said, surely that the greater than which cannot be thought cannot exist in the intellect alone. So in other words, it can't just exist in your mind as a concept. For if it exists solely in the intellect, it can be thought to exist in reality, which is greater. So, he's thinking, suppose. God, that the greater than which cannot be conceived, exists only in my mind as a concept, does not exist in reality. Ha! <laughs> then I can think of something even better than that. Something just like my concept, but did exist in reality. 
And that would be greater than the greatest conceivable being. But wait, the greatest conceivable being is the greatest thing you can conceive of. If you can conceive of it as not existing, you can think of something better, namely the same thing existing. <coughs> Therefore, God exists. Okay, if then that, the greater than which cannot be thought exists in the intellect alone, this same being, that which a greater cannot be thought, would be a great being, great, uh, <laughs> would be a being, the greater than which could be thought, namely, as existing in reality. But surely this is impossible. Therefore, there can be absolutely no doubt that something the greater than which cannot be thought exists both in the intellect and in reality. So, let's summarize the argument. Do you understand what the word God means? That the greater than which cannot be conceived. Greatest conceivable being. Greatest thing you can possibly think of. Okay, I understand. <laughs> Do you think there's such a being? Fool says no. And so says, okay. then you can think of something even better than your concept of God, this thing that's the greatest thing that can be thought, but on the other hand doesn't exist in reality. Think of that same being existing in reality. Wouldn't it be better to exist than not to exist? Sure. So that existing being, that's one that would even be greater to conceive of. Yeah. So the greatest conceivable being exists in reality. Yes. But that mean God, means God exists in reality. Now, what's your reaction to the argument? I see one person yawning. But what are other reactions? Yes? So Anselm is assuming that if someone thinks there's something better, then that thing cannot exist. Oh, well, no, no, no. It's not a general principle that if I can think of something better, that thing doesn't exist. Like, you're thinking, yeah, I can think of a better professor. So I was like, I'm God. <laughs> I don't exist. <laughs> no, it's not like that, okay? Um, why? Because I'm not the greatest conceivable being, and there's no claim here about being the greatest conceivable professor or the greatest conceivable dinner last night or any of that sort of thing. However, God is supposed to be the perfect being, the being the greater than which cannot be thought. And if that being didn't exist in reality, you'd think, okay, I think there's such a being that doesn't exist. Then, oh, wait a minute, I could imagine something even better. Something like that that did exist. <laughs> so that would be the greatest conceivable being. So in short, the greatest conceivable being would have to exist in reality. But what if you don't believe it exists and you don't believe that something could be better? What if you don't think it exists what, what and don't if, think something... What some... you don't believe in is what you already think is the best. Ah, okay, yes. Um, we should say something about the difference between being conceivable and being possible. There's an assumption here uh, you might think that this greatest conceivable being is actually a possible being. In other words, I say this exists in, in the understanding, meaning, I look, I understand what you mean when you say God. Um, so I have the concept of God. But you might think, well, wait a minute, all right, so that is conceivable. God is conceivable for you, but we should be careful. Does that mean that being is really possible? Maybe you can conceive of things that aren't really possible. Um, like, I don't know, there's a mathematical conjecture, and you're thinking about it, and you're wondering whether or not it's true. Nobody's proved it, but nobody's proved that it's false. You're thinking, I don't know, I can imagine it come out, coming out either way. <laughs> um, but it's not possible for it to come out either way, presumably. It's going to turn out to be either provable or disprovable, let's say. And so that would be a case where it's being conceivable doesn't mean it's possible. And you might worry that that's the same here. Maybe I conceive of God, but that doesn't mean it's possible. And so maybe this idea that I'm conceiving of God as existing is actually conceiving of impossibility. We should worry about that. Other reactions, yes? I'm still a little confused at what he's trying to get at, but it seems like he's getting at that um, there's a proof to God's existence through your mind. And if God is inconceivable to the human mind, then how is this conception of a concept of perfection from us, how can we conceive of this concept of perfection? Um, how can we perceive the concept of a perfect being at all if it's so beyond our, our mental ability? Okay, great. Um, next time we're going to look at arguments concerning God that don't start with the assumption that we can actually understand uh, what God is. Here he is starting with the definition of God. I think in part inspired by Augusta. This idea of the most excellent being there is, He's thinking, what about the most excellent being there even could be? That's a better characterization of God. And then he's basically, well, I should say, all of this is directed in the second person toward God. So does Anselm actually intend this as a proof? That's the way most philosophers take it. 
But it's in the context of a prayer. He's saying, you, O oh God, are so great that nothing greater than can, can be conceived. And that implies that you exist. And so it might be that he's really not intending this as a general definition. Anyway, next time we're going to look at the thought of Blaise Pascal, who starts from the assumption that we actually can't know anything about what God is. We can't even conceive of God. But then he draws certain conclusions from that. And so here we are starting with the assumption that we can actually understand God well enough to give a definition, like the most perfect being, or the, the most excellent thing there could be, um, the greatest conceivable being, that the greater than which cannot be thought, something like that. And so you're absolutely right. Here he's assuming I can understand what God is, and once I understand that, I realize God has to exist. But you could question that first part and think, God is so great, if God exists, <laughs> that we couldn't really conceive of or define God. And from that starting point, you'd reject this beginning and say, look, I, I don't think I can know even that. Yeah? Uh, is the way he's arguing this, does he aim to say that God is, there was one specific being? Or, because whenever we were talking about the skeptics, you were saying that God could be, you know, a committee or, you know, just kind of a, this entity, Ooh. not precisely a single particular instance or being. Well, that's a good point, actually. God, the greater than which cannot be conceived. Um, that, let's go with that definition for a moment. That doesn't actually give you much detail about what this God would be like, right? So you might think, okay, I'm someone with you. So should I be like a Catholic or a Lutheran or a Muslim or a Jew or maybe I should be a Hindu? Um, tell me more about this God. And so far, we don't know anything like that, right? And indeed, Hume would say, maybe this God is a committee of divine beings, or maybe this God is like a, a baby that's learning its craft, etc., etc., and we can think, of, yeah, okay, so far we don't know. Now, a baby learning its craft, surely you can think of something better, something that already knows its craft. So some of these I think he could rule out, but other, others it's going to not at all follow. So this is a very abstract characterization, and it's open to people to say, I don't think this has much to do with actual religious practice. Uh, the moment you actually say, well, let's then fall for our knees and pray. Who are we praying to? And what, what would the content of a religion based on this look like? And I think there is a huge gap between this and then any particular conception of God. Yeah? Is it just that he's making a, a distinction between reality and intellect? If it's in reality, it's automatically going to be better than it's just in Ah, okay, yes, he is drawing that distinction between existing in the intellect and existing in reality. And for this being, at least, existing in reality is going to be better, because it's the greatest conceivable being. Now, it won't be true for everything that it's better if it exists, right? Can you think of anything that you're like, yeah, I'm glad that doesn't exist. It would not be good for that to exist. It would be worse if it existed. Nightmares. Say it again. Nightmares. Nightmares, yeah, okay, a nightmare is real, but it exists in the mind. What if it were real? Exactly. Well, then it would even be worse, right? <laughs> um, I had a dream the other night that I, I, I had a dream that I was dreaming. And then in the dream, I dreamt that I woke up and went to the bathroom. And I couldn't get to the toilet because the bathroom was covered with cats. <laughs> Why would I have such a dream? But anyway, luckily then I woke up and realized, oh, wait, I was dreaming that I was dreaming and I woke up and the bathroom was covered with cats. And then I walked into the actual bathroom, awake, and there were no cats. Yay. But it would have been a lot worse if the bathroom had been covered with cats, so I couldn't have gone to the bathroom. Uh, so anyway, that's a silly example, but yes, um, there are dreams, there are nightmares that, you know, it's better that they do not exist. Other examples of things like that. Yeah? I would say, like, whatever you would consider to be, like, your ideal person, whether for, like, a relationship or something, like, your standards are going to be so high that reality will not be that limit. Like, you, it just, it, the way things are set up, like, if you have a real person, you just can't. All right, good. I'm going to come to a very similar point in a few minutes. But yes, I, you're actually adding a twist on it I haven't thought of, which is imagine your ideal soulmate. Okay, the person who would be perfect. The perfect girl, the perfect guy. Now, would it be better if that person really existed? I mean, 
seems kind of compelling when you think about it. <laughs> However, you could think, but wait, you know, maybe that person might exist, but what if like, I never meet them? And I go through life searching for that perfect person, knowing that they're somewhere and then I never find them. Or what if then I look at the actual girlfriend or boyfriend or husband or wife that I have and I think, oh man, you don't measure up. <laughs> right? And so on. So it's like, yeah, maybe it's not that good an idea for that to exist. And you know, now we, have, we haven't even gotten to diseases, plagues, tornadoes, etc., etc. Presumably it's better if that horrible storm that kills millions of people does not exist. But it's different for the greatest conceivable being. Now, here's one way of thinking about this argument in outline form. Suppose you could conceive of God not existing. Then you could think of something greater than God, namely, the being just like that, but actually existing. But hold on a second, nothing can be conceived as greater than God, so God's non-existence is inconceivable. Inconceivable. No Princess Bride references here? I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> but no, anyway, the whole idea would be, wait, I think it's conceivable. Yes, here I am, imagining God is not existing. But hold on a second. There'd be then something better. That being existing. Huh. So it's inconceivable that God doesn't exist. Yeah? So maybe this argument could work if you just presume that God is all the best qualities. But as a Christian, he has other concrete details that he could believe in. God, we could dispute those. So right. Like, like, one might say, oh, well, in this part of the Bible, I could think of a way God could have been more kinder, or more just, or whatnot. So that would be a way of, you could conceive of something better, because it's not necessarily that his biblical version of God matches up with his definition of God. Ooh. All right, now that's a very interesting point. Um, I was talking before about the gap between this abstract conception of God, sort of a philosopher's conception of God, and then the actual concept of God is expressed in a real historical religion, like Christianity or Hinduism or Judaism or Islam. And there definitely is a gap there. But he's pointing out that there's not only a gap, there could even be a conflict. After all, look at the text of any of those religions, and you will find God doing things that are a little bit shocking. Um, in the Old Testament, for example, think about what happens when uh, Joshua conquers the Promised Land. Read the book of Joshua, and there are a lot of things happen there that are, you know, at best morally ambiguous and often morally outrageous. Uh, you know, sort of, yeah, let's take the village, let's kill everybody inside it, and let's kill all the animals, let's kill all the cats and dogs and jeeps and goats. And you might think, really? I mean, what they do? Now, I have a colleague who says, no, it was right, because when cats and dogs and sheep and goats, <laughs> sheep and goats, are around bad people, they do bad things, and those were bad people, and they deserve to die, and those were bad sheep, and bad goats, and bad dogs, and bad cats. And, all right, that's one try way of trying to defend this, but you might also think, oh, gosh, you know, I don't know if that's such a great thing. And it's going to be the same if you turn to other religions. It's not all just that particular story. And you might think, yeah, I don't know, this idea of that the greater which cannot be thought, and then the God that is actually portrayed in various religions, um, you might think it's not just there's a bit of a gap of specificity there. There are places where I start feeling uncomfortable, and I don't know how to reconcile this definition with that concept of God. So, so yes, you can start worrying that this philosopher's concept isn't just too abstract. Maybe it even conflicts with certain ways of thinking about religion, or at any rate, um, God in relationship to humanity. But here's the way uh, we might think of this. I'm going to use the abbreviation GCB for greatest conceivable being, just to make this shorter. Suppose the greatest conceivable being exists solely in the intellect. Well, you can think of it as existing in reality, but one existing in reality is greater than one that exists in the intellect alone. So it's possible to ex conceive of something greater than the greatest conceivable being. But that's absurd. So the greatest conceivable being can't exist in the intellect alone. Now what that tells us is either we're wrong to assume that it exists in the intellect, or it exists in reality. And so Anselm is really presenting you with a choice. Either you have to say that the concept of God is incoherent, that God's existence is impossible, that the concept doesn't even make any sense, 
or you've got to admit that God exists. So the fool is the one who says, yeah, I understand what God means, and yeah, it's possible that there's such a being, but I don't believe there is. He's saying that's incoherent. You either have to say, what? You're talking, I don't think your idea of God makes any sense. I don't even know what you're talking about. That is a coherent position, he says, and so is the position that says, yes, God exists. But this idea that, yeah, it's possible there's God, but I don't think there really is, that, he's saying, is incoherent. Either God's existence is impossible, or, as we'll see in a moment, it's necessary. There's no in-between. So here's a way of trying to represent it graphically. Take that big blue circle as the class of conceivable beings. Those are the things you could think, okay? You could conceive of, you could imagine. Um, and then think of that gray circle as those that actually exist. Presumably, we can think of a vast array of things that do not actually exist. So the class of existing beings there is relatively small, and then there are all these things we can conceive of that don't actually exist. Well, imagine that one of those, I'll put it at the top of the circle there, is the greatest conceivable being. It is that the greater than which cannot be thought. And suppose, as the fool thinks here, it's outside that class of existing beings. It's floating way up there, very far from existing. Now, when self says, actually, that's incoherent. Why? Well, because it wouldn't be greatest there. We could conceive of something just like it, but as actually existing. And so we could conceive of something that was also the greatest conceivable being, but was actually existing. And that would be better. That would be a better being. Something that, you know, has all these great qualities but doesn't exist, that's not nearly as good as something that has those qualities and does exist. Think about Describing your girlfriend, okay? Um, your mom says, hey, you've been off at college for a while. Have you met anybody? You say, oh, yeah, she's this awesome girl. She's beautiful. She's brilliant. She's so nice. She's so kind. She's, I mean, she's just wonderful to me. Um, takes care of me, laughs at all my jokes, comes up with all these great thoughts that I ever had before, and I, I'm just fascinated by her. She's wonderful. Well, really? I mean, wow, she sounds perfect. You mean she has no defects at all? Well, there's one. She doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a pretty serious defect, right? And so that'd be something like this greatest conceivable being. I'll tell you about this greatest conceivable being. All-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, entirely compassionate. There's just one problem. It doesn't exist. <laughs> And you might think, yeah, that's a pretty serious problem. I can think of something better. Something that is all-knowing and all-powerful and compassionate and all-good. Oh, yeah, it actually existed. Now, that's the idea. That being would be greater. So actually, the greatest conceivable being has to be within that class of existing beings. If it's not, we can think of something better. Something like that that actually exists. Now, does the picture convince you? <laughs> Here's one thing you might think about. You might say, wait, wait a minute. There's something a little slip going on here. I remember talking to somebody in graduate school about this argument, saying, hey, I thought it worked. I thought it was a valid argument. And this person said, wait a minute. You think that's a valid argument? I remember the moment very well. We were driving, I was driving down Murray Avenue in Pittsburgh. We're going to Minio's Pizza Shop, which is the greatest pizza on the planet. Uh, <laughs> they put a pound of cheese on every pizza. I mean, actually, it's sort of disgusting now that I look back. <laughs> it's really, really thick, and it's just gooey, and it's a million calories, but it's awesome. Anyway, we're going to this pizza shop, and I remember he said to me, no, I think there's a problem with the argument. And this was the problem. There is a difference between existing and being conceived of as existing. Notice the way I describe this. I can conceive of this being that is perfect, all-knowing, all-powerful, um, exists everywhere, eternally, is necessary, um, is compassionate, is entirely good. But then I say, oh yeah, it doesn't exist. And then the claim is, well, I can think of something better, something just like that, but I conceive of it as existing. And you might say, well, wait, there's a big difference between conceiving of something as existing and having it actually exist. Suppose somebody is hearing me describe this fictional girlfriend and then says, ah, okay, 
They think that person exists. They conceive of that person as actually existing, but they're wrong. That person doesn't exist. Or imagine that we're talking about some character from history, King Arthur, or uh, here I'm thinking of something mythological, and there's a debate about whether that being really exists, whether there really was a King Arthur, whether there really was, um, gosh, what are some other figures like that from sort of the dim recesses of history where some people say that person is mythical and others say that person exists. Anyway, fill in the blank with whatever such person you had in mind. It's one thing for that person to really exist. It's another for somebody to conceive of them as existing. Somebody might conceive of that person as existing even though they didn't exist. Somebody else might actually not conceive of them as existing, thinking, no, it's all a myth. That there's no real person there. And the person did actually exist. So those are two different things. Lots of things exist, and we conceive of them as, as existing. I exist, and you conceive of me as existing. So yay, I'm in that intersection. But there are things that exist that we don't conceive of as existing, things we haven't even imagined yet. Um, think about heaven. You know, there are more things on heaven and earth that are dreamt of in your philosophy. Undoubtedly, there are things that are existing that we have never even conceived of as existing. But also, we probably conceive of certain things as existing that don't really exist. We're wrong about them. So, the objection would go like this. There's a gap here between conceiving of a being as existing and it actually existing. In other words, you're saying, I can't conceive of the greatest conceivable being as non-existing. I have to conceive of it as existing. Well, okay, suppose that's true. It doesn't follow the being exists. It just says you have to think of it as existing. It would be like saying, yeah, if you're going to write your dissertation on King Arthur, you better assume that King Arthur exists. That's not to say King Arthur really did exist. Maybe it's all just a bunch of stories. But nevertheless, you had better conceive of that person as existing just to motivate yourself to write the dissertation. So anyway, you might argue that really Anselm subtly substitutes one for the other. He's giving you an argument that if you're going to conceive of God, you've got to conceive of God as, as existing. Otherwise, it, there's an incoherence. On the other hand, that doesn't seem to prove that God actually exists. It's an argument that you have to, to be consistent, think in a certain way, but it doesn't seem to actually reach reality. In fact, the most common objection to this argument is just, wait, thinking about my own concepts can't possibly lead me to conclusions about the outside world. There's a big gap between my mind and the world. <laughs> and this is one way of putting that more specifically. Yeah, it's one thing for me internally, in my mind, to conceive of something as existing. It's very different for, for it to actually exist. Now, does that defeat the argument? Do we say, ah, sorry, Anselm. Nice try, but no cigar. Well, here's one way you might think about it. You could say, yes, it defeats it. Because really, we haven't gotten outside our own heads. Really, all we've shown is that we can't conceive of God except to conceive of God as existing. But that doesn't mean that God actually exists in reality. We haven't proved God's existence. We've only proved that a certain way of thinking about God doesn't make sense, is incoherent. At best, we proved that. But there's another way of looking at it. We'd still have shown that you can't really conceive of God without conceiving of God as existing. So it would still be true that the position of the fool who says, I know what you mean in talking about God. Yeah, I can imagine God too. I can conceive of God. I just don't think there is any such thing. I conceive of God as not existing. That's still going to look incoherent from Anselm's point of view. He's going to say, no, I've shown you you can't do that. You claim to have the great concept of the greatest conceivable being, but it's a concept of something that does not exist. So your concept is more or less something like, ah, yes, omniscient, omnipotent, all good. Um, all caring, and, oh yeah, non-existent. And he said, that concept doesn't make any sense. If God is really perfect in all these ways, God has to exist too. So you've got to conceive of God as existing. Now, does that mean God actually exists? Well, maybe not, but it would say you can't have the position of the fool, saying I can make sense of the idea, I have the concept, but I conceive of God as not existing. And so I'm saying, you can't do that. If you've got a concept of God, you're conceiving of God as existing. And if you don't have that, you don't have the concept at all. Well, let's go back to my other way of phrasing this in terms of inconceivability. Suppose you could conceive of God's non-existence, as the fool claims to do, and some saying, 
then you could think of something greater than God. And that's incoherent. So actually, it's still true that God's non-existence is inconceivable. Okay? Nothing could be conceived as greater than God. Now, if God's non-existence is not just not the case, but inconceivable, we could actually strengthen the argument. And this is what Anselm proceeds to do. He says, yes, think of God as that the greater than which cannot be thought. Now, could that God not exist? In other words, whether God actually exists or not, let's think about whether it's even possible for God not to exist. Suppose there were a being that, whether it existed or not, might not exist. Gosh, I could think of a better being. A being that didn't have any threat to it, its existence at all. That existed necessarily. So, actually, now his conclusion is, my concept of God entails not just existence, but necessary existence. That the greater thing which cannot be thought must exist necessarily. If it exists only contingently, I could think of something better, whose existence was not contingent, but actually necessary. So, it is inconceivable that God not exist. It is God, inconceivable that God's existence even be contingent. God has to exist necessarily. Well, a monk named Ganilo raised an objection to Anselm. It's not exactly the objection we've raised. It's an objection that says, wait, your argument proves much too much. It's an objection concerning the perfect eye. <laughs> So Gaudilo writes and says, I want you to think about not just the greatest island there is on Earth. Maybe you have a book. It's the kind of thing, actually, I can imagine certain travel magazines writing articles about. Click there, you know. Um, click here for the five greatest islands in the world. And it's like, ooh, okay, you know, maybe Oahu, number five. And then, let's see, number four, Fiji. And number three, Tahiti. And number two, Kauai. And then number one is, I don't know, right? You have to read the article. You have to click to find out. <laughs> anyway, think not just about the greatest island on Earth, but the greatest conceivable island, the best island there could possibly be. Not just the most excellent island there is, the most excellent island there could be. Now, Ganilo says, OK, they say there is in the ocean somewhere an island. Some have called it the Lost Island. The story goes that it's blessed with all manner of priceless riches and delights in abundance. Now, if anybody tells me it's like this, I'll easily understand what is said, since nothing is difficult about it. But if you should then go on to say, as though it were a logical consequence of this, you cannot any more doubt that this island exists and is more excellent than all other lands, somewhere in reality, then you can doubt that it is in your mind, since it's more excellent to exist not only in the mind alone, but also in reality. Therefore, it must needs be that it exists. In other words, he's imagining an ontological argument for islands. Think of the greatest conceivable island. Does it really exist? Probably not. I mean, in all those places I've mentioned, you have to pay for your drinks. You have to pay for your food. My greatest possible island would be one where you don't have to pay for anything, right? You just snap your fingers. It's like, yeah, another margarita. Oh, there it is. Right, that'd be awesome. That's better than the actual island. Now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm lost in this vision of the lost <laughs> island. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Uh, but anyway, suppose you think, okay, great. Now, does that island exist? What if it doesn't? I think actually, no, it doesn't exist. But then, Gandhiro says, wait a minute. By Anselm's reasoning, I can imagine a better island. One just like that that does exist. So the greatest conceivable island exists. There is a place with free margaritas. Now you're going to think, yeah. Something's ter not terribly wrong, right? Now, this kind of objection is an objection that's very powerful, but it is also dangerous, because so far we don't know what's wrong with the argument. It's just really saying, well, if that form of argument works, then you can prove of all sorts of others, other ridiculous things. You can prove the existence of the perfect island, of the perfect student, of the perfect professor, the perfect soulmate, etc., etc. And, in fact, that's absurd. We don't think any of those arguments work. So, so far we haven't identified exactly where this argument goes wrong, but nevertheless, this is a pretty powerful indicator that something's gone wrong. Well, what's your reaction to that objection? Does it defeat Anselm's argument? Yeah? I think the objection is that they don't think that there is an island. Unless he's considering, like, 
all throughout the universe and all the possible scenarios you can think of are possible. Great. Okay, all right, good. I mean, one way to look at it is to say, look, it's pointing out the same basic problem. That is to say, it really is indicating that imagining the greatest possible item, and then imagining it existing or not existing, that has nothing to do with, how, with what's out there in reality, right? What's out there is what's out there. And then I say, ooh, yes, I'm going to think of this possible island that is just perfect. I mean, you know, the hotel rooms are free. The views are all beautiful. The drinks, the food, they're all free. The weather, it's perfect. It's just ideal. And if, if you think, oh, but for me, this is a little too warm or a little too cool, snap your fingers, and your little local environment is exactly what you want. Awesome, right? Perfect. Now, I'm imagining it existing. Does suddenly in the world, the sea part, and an island arrives where everything is free and everything is beautiful. No, right? Whatever is going on in my mind has nothing to do with what's in reality. And so you might think, that's why this does work against it. It really says, look, the existence of some island or other has nothing to do with the way I'm thinking about it. So similarly, the existence of a supernatural being, you might think, has nothing to do with how I conceive of God or what I'm thinking about or whether I conceive of God as existing or not existing. I can't draw any conclusions about reality from my thoughts about islands, so neither can I think, draw any conclusions about reality from my thoughts about supernatural beings. Yeah? So what I was thinking was, everyone's definition of a perfect island would be different, right? So it's Ooh, subjective. Yes. So similarly with God, what if two people have definitions of God that are radically different, but it's one supreme being, how would that exist? Ooh, all right, now that's an interesting twist on this argument. At Gamilo could have said, hey look, what's a perfect island for you may not be a perfect island for me. I mean, tell me more about your perfect diet. Yeah. Because I think, like, as you say, like, it would just shape an individual's experience by their own meaning, but it wouldn't affect what actually it is. So it does affect the view, how you experience stuff, but it doesn't affect yourself or ah. your experience. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah, I mean, is there such a thing as the objective greatest conceivable island? You might worry that it's too subjective, and if this argument works, we don't just get one perfect island. Each of you gets to generate your own perfect island. There's an island that's perfect for you, and one for you, and one for you, and so on. And you might think, oh, all right, now, then it gets super scary if we apply that to religion. Because it's like, ooh, you know, the god of Judaism, as opposed to the god of Hinduism, as opposed to the Christian god, as opposed to the Muslim god. Don't worry, they all exist. You, Muslim, you have that concept? You're good to go. Allah for you. <laughs> you, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You got it, man. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, any other takers? Ah, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. They might think, wait, wait, wait. No, this is, <laughs> this is not surely the way it could possibly go. And we can now get back to that question of other perfect, the perfect soulmate. Okay, from one of my favorite TV shows, The Good Place. Very, the guy on the left there is the philosophy professor in the show. I mean, what's not to like? A show involving a philosophy professor. And they also mention how much everyone hates philosophy professors. That's, that's true. Uh, they say a lot of unkind things about philosophy professors. Um, and here is now Anselm's reply to this. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's the problem. I said a greatest conceivable being existing in reality is one that is greater than one existing in the intellect alone. That holds for the greatest conceivable being. We've already seen it doesn't hold for everything. It doesn't hold for diseases, or plagues, or, or viruses, or mosquitoes, <laughs> or um, what are some of the other things we mentioned that it doesn't hold for. Well, it doesn't hold for everything, in other words. It's not just anything. I'm talking about the greatest conceivable being. Not existing would be a flaw in it. It's not necessarily a flaw in an island, or in another thing. So this argument works only, he says, for the greatest conceivable being. Well, I don't know whether you buy that or not, but let's look at a couple of variants that appear in Descartes. Descartes gives this in the fifth meditation as his version of the ontological argument. It has the virtue of simplicity. He simply says, here's my definition of God. God is the perfect being. God has all perfections. Existence is a perfection. Therefore, God has existence. The end. <laughs> It's short and sweet. Now, how do you like that? God's perfect. Existence isn't perfection. So God exists. Yeah. See, all these arguments, like, they apply like a, like a human, like, 
criterion to God, like, like greatest, like what does that mean? Like that's completely subjective. Like when Anselm says greatest, does he mean like the demiurgic being that creates, or does he mean like the aloof, loving being? And like when Descartes says existence is a perfection, like where did he draw that from? Like he's completely applying his own definition of perfection, not some, you know, universal existential idea of perfection. He's providing his own. All right, he's making two points, really. One is, God has all perfections. Once again, we're defining God. And you might worry that that's a subjective thing. Different people might have different definitions. You might also worry that maybe God is really inconceivable and so not definable. But then the second premise, too, existence is a perfection. We've just seen that existence isn't something that makes a disease better, it makes it worse. It doesn't make a nightmare better, it makes it worse. So we should worry about that and wonder also, whether, not only whether it's true, but where he's getting it. Yeah? Um, we also um, put existence to a human standard. What does existence mean in terms of us versus in terms of God? Um, when we say yeah. I exist, we give existence a very mundane are, are we giving existence a mundane standard, or is existence as simple as being here or not being here? Good. For God, is his existence different? That's a really interesting objection, yes. Thomas Aquinas does not list this argument among his five ways of proving God's existence. And he offers an objection to the argument that's like some you've brought up, and like that one, saying, look, um, we've got to be very careful about predicates we apply to God, and then the same predicate applied to human beings. They don't necessarily mean the same thing, and in particular, when we talk about God existing, it's not the same kind of thing. Aquinas himself says, God is existence. It's not merely that God has existence, that God just exists in the way that you and I do. And so we need to be cautious about all of this. Now, I'm going to skip past a couple of things, just so that I can get to a couple of key points here near the end. Kant raises this objection. He says, exists isn't a real or a determining predicate. And what he means is this. Um, it's sort of a... Something that doesn't really specify anything. So to conceive of something as existing or not existing, he said, it's not to add any content. Um, suppose I think about a dollar, and then I think about an existing dollar. There's no difference between those two things, he says. So existence isn't the kind of thing that could be a perfection. It's not really something that has, adds any content to anything. If I say, imagine God is all-powerful, that adds content to my concept. But if I say, think of God as existing, it doesn't add any content. It's not doing anything. And so he thinks exists isn't a predicate at all. Now, I worry about this a little bit. Suppose we're having an essay contest, as we do typically in the philosophy department each year. And, you know, I think about the greatest possible paper, and then I think about the actual existing papers. Often this happens. I think, yeah, my students are going to write these brilliant papers. And then I have to judge the actual papers. And there's a big gap, okay? <laughs> and so. I think about the possible papers and the existing papers, and it feels like I've been conceiving of two very different things. Also, there's a joke here that goes like this. Academics judge other academics on what they have written, but they judge themselves on the basis of what they could write, <laughs> might write. And that's really true, actually. That's exactly what we do. We look at what somebody else has done and think, yeah, none of that's that great. But me, well, what I've actually published isn't that great either, but there are all these thoughts I have about what I might do, and they're awesome. <laughs> okay, and so to think about what somebody has done, think what they might do, that feels like a different thing. In any case, here is a modern version of the ontological argument that some contemporary philosophers have put forward. It's possible that there's a God. The concept of God is consistent. It's necessarily true that God exists. God doesn't just exist contingently. God, if he exists, exists necessarily. Therefore, God exists necessarily. Now, at first glance, you might think, what? It's possible that God exists? If he exists, it's not just the contingent matter that he exists, so he does exist necessarily. You might think, well, it's a little quick. So here's how the argument actually goes. It uses Leibniz's idea that to exist necessarily is to exist in all possible worlds. For it to be possible for God to exist is for God to exist in some possible world. So imagine that purple world is our world. We say, well, it's true here that I don't know if God exists, but hey, it's possible that God exists. So there is some world, here marked as that red world, where God exists. That's what it means for it to be possible for God to exist. There is some possible world where God exists. But now, 
If God exists, God exists necessarily. Which means if God exists in that red world, then God has to exist in every possible world, including our world. So God does exist in our world. And for that matter, in every other possible world, so God exists necessarily. That's kind of a cool argument, isn't it? That, if you want to learn more about that, study the beautiful subject of modal logic, where you study the logical possibility and necessity and so on. But now, in the last two minutes, well, I'll give you Kurt Gödel's version of this argument. Gödel is the greatest logician of the 20th century, and he actually came up with his own version of the ontological argument. It goes like this. It wasn't published until after his death. Uh, no one knew he was a Christian, even, until after he died, when it emerged from his papers that every Sunday morning he would sing hymns and read the Bible, and he came up with this argument. Anyway, here is how it goes. Some properties are positive, others are negative. Now, here's an axiom. Properties that are positive are necessarily positive. They don't just happen to be positive. It's part of the concept. <laughs> Second axiom. If it's positive, then its negation, not F, is not positive. Any property that's entailed by a positive property is positive. And then he proves a little theorem. Each positive property is consistent. That is to say, it could be instantiated. Now, here's a definition. Something is godlike if and only if it has all and only positive properties. And it has them essentially. Well, here's another axiom. Being godlike is a positive property. So, theorem. Being godlike is possible, possibly instantiated. In other words, it's possible there's a god. But then another axiom. Necessary existence is a positive property. Anything godlike is essentially godlike. That means anything godlike is essentially necessarily existent. existent. So, necessarily, something is godlike. But that means, necessarily, there is a God. Descartes gives another argument, and I have 13 seconds to summarize it, but it's easy to summarize. I have the concept of God. Where did I get it? Could only come from God. <laughs> there you go. Next time, we'll talk about Pascal and the possibility that we can't even conceive of God and what that would mean.